I, I try to put two questions to you, which come from about 20 little pieces of paper. Um, a lot of questions came in concerning the structure of the movements that you uh, were asked in the beginning and talked about. Uh, I read them out. How can a decentralized, disorganized movement fight successfully against centralized and organized capitalist institutions? Is this not an illusion? This is a question from Gordon Bosch. Um, another question. Um, if various forms of social activism do not, don't need single agenda, in which sense uh, can you talk about them being together? Um, is this struggle against control only that unites the movement or nothing else? Any issues that unites the movement? Um, question from Peter Farkas, Attak, Hungary. Um, a colleague of yours, at MIT, Leslie Farrow, um, said that uh, everybody knows that capitalism uh, has to be brought down and the only ways uh, that it can be brought down is through um, economic crash, world crash or a public revolution. Do you see any chances of any of these uh, in the coming five, ten years? <laughs> or or any other way of bringing the system down. Um, that should be enough for a first answer. But well, first I, all, I, I wouldn't like to put any constraints on you, but we yeah, are running out of time. Oh, I'll try to be brief. Okay. Uh, Lester Thoreau is, uh, we're in the same university, but to say we're colleagues is a little misleading. Uh, he was the director of the School of Management. So he's training people to become managers of major corporations. He doesn't think that the system should be broken down. You can be sure of that. Um, he might have said that uh, you know maybe a crisis will come and it will break down, but uh, that's not his commitment. Uh, the uh, uh, the main question is, first of all, what's shared by the social movement? Well, you know, if you take them all together, probably not much. Uh, but if you take very large components of them, quite a lot of things are shared, uh, like uh, attitudes on. Uh, sexism, racism, aggression, militarism, uh, the existence of corporations, uh, the basic structures of capitalism, uh, you know, human rights. I mean, on those issues, a lot of things are shared, often down to considerable detail, like how a post-capitalist economy ought to run. You know, there are many interesting questions about how you would run a, a, a a society without uh, managerial control or private ownership or state ownership and so on. Uh, all of these, on all of these issues, you do find a fair measure of agreement. I mean, if you go into real details, you know, you'll get disagreement. But then there ought to be disagreement. I mean, does anybody know the right answer to these questions? You know, these are we don't really understand that much about human society and human life or human beings. I'm going to have to figure these things out experimentally. So it's right to have general guiding sort of visions, you know, some idea where you're trying to go, but to be exploratory and experimental in how you get there. Uh, those are things that have to be discovered. So I don't really see that as a weakness. In fact, if you look at the history of what's called the ideological left, say the Marxist movements, uh, they never had anything to say about a future society. Take a look at Marx. And Marx was a theorist of capitalism. Now you take a look at the whole Marx corpus, you know, a huge collection of volumes. There's about five sentences on what a post-capitalist society could be like. I mean, sentences you all memorize in the right, if you're the right age. Uh, you know, you're going to be a fisherman in the morning and a doctor in the afternoon and that sort of thing. There's a couple of sentences like that scattered around. But the rest, uh, there's no picture of a future society. In fact, Marx's actual proposals, Marx and Engels, are what we call reformists. If you read the Communist Manifesto, you know, there's say, yeah, there'll be some future society, but what he's actually what they're actually calling for are social reforms, social democratic reforms, and many of which have been instituted over the years. Uh, but there was no you know, there was no guiding ideology. It was supposed to be the iron laws of history, which are going to make certain things happen, and then uh, you know, 
workers take over and something happens, so we don't know why. Uh, if you look at Leninist ideology, yeah, that was very clear, and very simple. Follow me. Okay, that's, that's a simple ideology. Uh, but, uh, uh, but between those two, there's almost nothing on the traditional left. And the anarchists had a different point of view. They did develop conceptions of how a society ought to be organized and what you ought to do to build pieces of it in the present society and so on. But that's very characteristic of the contemporary movements. I mean, if they didn't read you know, they don't know the anarchist literature, they're sort of following the same path. You build pieces of a future society within the current one, and you try to erode its uh, belief system, its attitudes, its uh, structures of control, and so on, and gradually <coughs> develop a more uh, a free, democratic society. I think it makes perfect sense. Uh, so can a disorganized movement uh, overcome centralized control? Yeah, sure, it's happened right through history. In fact, every bit of progress you can think of has been like that. Uh, I mean, if it come, if there is a crash, if, suppose that some disaster takes place, which could happen. You know, for example, it's, it's quite likely you can make a probability, but it's not unlikely at all that there will be some massive terrorist attack in the West, maybe in the United States, uh, involving weapons of mass destruction, maybe nuclear weapons. I mean, it's really not that hard to sneak the parts of a small nuclear bomb into New York. Uh, we could probably do it with our limited talents. It really doesn't take much. Uh, there's tens of thousands of uh, components of nuclear weapons all over the world, uncontrolled. Uh, small nuclear weapons are really small, like 15 kilotons or something. Uh, anybody can sneak anything they like over the Canadian border. You, know, you don't have to go through the airport since it's a huge border. It can't be controlled. Uh, so, uh, 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 there's uh, most of the world's shipping, almost all of it, is in containers. Okay? Containers are not inspected. And they can't be inspected. Um, there have been some studies of what it would take to monitor the containers leaving Rotterdam and going to the United States. Turns out if you tried just to inspect those containers, all of Europe would be tied up on a massive traffic jam and which nobody could move, just plain gridlock, uh, because of the uh, amount of, you know, the side effects of trying to inspect the containers. There's no conceivable way you can inspect those. And you can't tell what's inside them, maybe pieces of nuclear weapons. Uh, so the idea that there will be, a, say, a major terrorist act in one of the Western countries, that's not unlikely. Uh, what would the effects be? Well, you know, they could be the political effect, or aside from killing and everything else. Um, the political effects could be catastrophic. Uh, you can imagine anything. Or suppose, let's take another possibility. Uh, takes, uh, the world is very much oil-based, hydrocarbon-based. You know, and that's increasing. Uh, everyone knows who thinks that in the longer term, it's devastating. Uh, probably destroy the environment. Uh, but this shorter-term problem, it's going to run out. You, know, you don't know exactly when. Uh, but nobody doubts that it's a, it's a finite resource. And at some point, it will just become too expensive to extract. And that point may not be very far away. Uh, there are new discoveries being made. Most of the oil is known where it is. And nobody expects much to be discovered. Uh, so it will, and in fact, uh, uh, you know, discovery is, has peaked and is probably leveling, uh, which means that and, and usage is going up constantly because there are very few attempts at serious conservation. So there is a potential crisis brewing. Uh, and if it turns out in a short period that uh, oil is not actually available at a sufficient rate, uh, there could again be devastating effects. There are no plans, serious plans, for how to shift to a non-oil-based economy. Uh, quite the contrary. I mean, planners are acting as if we don't have to worry about what's going to happen five years from now. What we have to do is make profit tomorrow. And that actually is built into the sort of state capitalist systems. You're not supposed to plan. You're supposed to maximize short-term profit. Uh, so there's a kind of a built-in catastrophe. I suppose it takes place. I mean, is that going to be good for the left? I don't think so. 
any of these catastrophes are much more likely to lead to some kind of fascism, I think. Um, that's not the way to bring about social change, to wait for a catastrophe. Uh, what you want to do is deal with these problems right now. Uh, and not a bad way to deal with them, I think, is through uh, what are called disorganized movements. That means movements that have a lot of spontaneity and initiative and pursuing their own objectives and keep their mind on what other people are doing, but they're not necessarily feeling they have to have some ideology that they can follow. I mean, if you look over the past, there never have been ideologies. This idea that there were left movements with ideologies that told you what to do is just a myth. Just take a look at the ideologies. They, nothing. Leninism had no ideologies. And Marx didn't even talk about the topic. Uh, it's, uh, uh, these are all mythologies designed to uh, kind of uh, aggrandize a centralized movements controlled by leadership groups right at the top by making it appear that there's some ideology that says if you follow me everything's going to work out but that's about the limits of the ideology it never existed